Q&A session. Good, I think we are ready to start. So let's have a look to the first um, part of this webinar about the assessment objectives. And the first thing that I might say is that I don't really like this wording, assessment objectives. I think it's better to talk about assessment criteria because this is really what the examiners will look in, uh, in the essays. That's why I introduced, I included this picture of, a, of this guy uh, <laughs> looking for something. So this, you should really see these assessment objectives as criteria that the examiners will, will use uh, when uh, assessing, when uh, marking an essay. And you know that currently um, they are based uh, on what we call the Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, and this is not only for Cambridge, if you look at IB, for example, this is essentially the, the same thing, um, where, um, where you have these different skills this, that students are expected to, to acquire. So it goes from basic skills, remembering is probably the most basic skill, understanding slightly deeper, slightly more demanding, a bit more sophisticated. And then as we go up uh, this pyramid, then each skill is more and more demanding, more and more requires more and more skills uh, and deeper and deeper or more advanced skills, basically. So we under, remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, create. So for Cambridge, uh, for our students, they are not expected to create. So we don't have the very last uh, section of the very last uh, level, uh, but all the other skills they are expected to do it. Uh, in uh, Cambridge, remembering and understanding, they fall under the same knowledge and understanding uh, assessment objective. But then we do find uh, apply, application, uh, analysis, and evaluation. Okay. And actually, the uh, first uh, comment that I would like to make is that in the current syllabus, there are four assessment objectives that I'm sure you are all familiar with this, uh, with this uh, assessment objectives, knowledge and understanding, application, analysis and evaluation. I'm going to have a look at each of them, uh, one after the other, to try to understand how students can actually uh, demonstrate each of those skills in their essay. But I just want to mention that in the future syllabus that starts in 2023, there will only be three assessment objectives as the application uh, assessment objective ha has been merged with the knowledge and understanding, okay? So, but since this will only start in 2023, I think we still have some time uh, working with the four uh, assessment objective um, syllabus. So I will focus on that today, okay? I will introduce each of these assessment objective and try to um, explain to you how your students can actually uh, score as um, many marks as possible in each assessment objective. Something that I often tell them is that they really have to sh demonstrate their skills. They, I jokingly say, you have to show off. I know we, I, I guess most of us, we, we work in China and humility is a, a value, a quality that is very highly regarded. But I often jokingly say to them, you really, if, if there is one day you have to show off and know what you can do, this is when taking an examination. You have to demonstrate your skills. You have to really show them what you can do. Simply because if you don't, if you don't demonstrate that you know the definitions, that you know how to illustrate your points, that you are able to uh, logically connect different concepts, if you don't show them that you are able to make evaluative comments to critically assess the points that you have previously put forward, then the examiners will not be able to award you these this marks, these grades. So you have to show off, you need to show what you can do when you write an essay. What skills? The first one, knowledge and understanding. I think we, could, we can agree that this is the most um, basic uh, skill to, to demonstrate when writing an essay and there are actually several ways students can uh, demonstrate their knowledge and understanding. The first one, the first thing that they should do is what I say to speak economics. 
I often ask the student, how, how many languages do you speak? And well, we, uh, I teach in China. So most of them, we, we, we are in an international school. Most of them tell me, oh, I, I speak two languages. I speak uh, Chinese and I speak English. And then I tell them, no, 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 you speak much more languages than that. So then they are a bit puzzled and, and, they, and they try to think about what I mean. And then some of them say, mm, we also speak the local dialects. I say, no, 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 that's not what I was talking about. So then some of them can guess and say, oh, we can speak economics. Say, yes, you can speak economics, you can speak physics, you can speak biology, chemistry. All these subjects that you learn, they come up with their own vocabulary, with their own concepts, and you know them. And if you want to demonstrate that your knowledge and understanding, you have to use this terminology, you have to use these words, these key concepts as often as possible. And I'm going to show you an example let me just uh, share uh, my screen again. You should now see uh, a Word document, which is basically a, a sample answer that I have typed for, for an essay. And um, <clears throat> I have highlighted all the keywords that I have used in this essay. Look at that, it's everywhere, you see? So that's A2, it's about consumer equilibrium in A2. And you see that as soon as I have the opportunity to use a key concept in my sentences, then I have to do it simply to show the examiner that I am able to, uh, to speak that language and to use it properly in the right context. So that is something that I feel is extremely important for the students. They should be able to speak economics. Second thing that should be used to demonstrate knowledge and understanding is obviously to define key concepts. Uh, something else, let me show you a second sample about the definitions. I should have it there, okay. You see, so that's the same, I think that's the same essay. Yeah, it is the same essay, the same sample answer, but here what I have highlighted uh, are all the definitions, okay. So everything that is highlighted in, in, in yellow here uh, are keywords that I have defined. So we have one there, one there, one there. And something that I, I want to say right now is that sometimes students, they feel like well, they, they, they should start their essays by making a very long list of definitions, like def defining all the keywords that they will use throughout their essay, even key concepts that they will only use in the second or third part of their essay. And that is definitely not a, a good idea. It's true that often an essay starts with a definition because you can't really start without it. But you should only, or your students should only define or their, the, define the concepts at the beginning of the essay, only the concepts that they need to start. Okay, if, if uh, they want to talk about the price elasticity of demand in the second or third part of the essay, this is not necessary and not useful and actually not a good idea to define it at the beginning, okay? And this is just very boring to read a long list of definitions uh, because we don't understand why the student is, is giving all these definitions at the beginning, okay? Uh, so yeah, definitions, of course, that's one a very effective way to demonstrate knowledge and understanding. The, this could also be formula, not very often, but this could be the formula of the price elasticity of demand, how we calculate it. This could be the formula of the average fixed cost, yeah, in A2. So sometimes it's also appropriate to give formula. And there could be diagrams. So diagrams can actually be used for many assessment objectives. Diagrams can be used for application. Yeah, sometimes it works. Diagrams can also be used for analysis, yes. Uh, but they can also, in some cases, they can also be used for uh, to uh, support uh, the knowledge and understanding. So for example, if you uh, define a consumer surplus and producer surplus, then you could actually graph it, show the diagram uh, to, uh, to actually show how we can represent it. And to my understanding, this, this could be regarded as a demonstration of knowledge and understanding. Same thing, you could uh, have, should graph the diagram of productive efficiency in a firm, you know, the minimum of the ATC. I would also regard this as um, a demonstration of knowledge and understanding. Okay, so these are essentially the four main advices that are the main, four main things that your students should do in order to demonstrate their knowledge and understanding. 
a very important tip that I think you should all share with your students if you do, have not yet done it, is that when they write an essay, your students should assume that the examiner knows nothing about economics. And actually, when I mark an essay, I pretend that I have never studied economics before. If I can understand the entire essay, it means that it's good. It means that everything has been defined, everything has been explained. So even someone who has not studied economics could understand. If I can't, if there are things that are not defined or some things not explained, some diagrams that are not uh, commented, then it means that this is not a very good economics essay. So what I usually, or we have a pineapple doing some artwork on my PPT. <laughs> what I actually tell them is when you write your essay, pretend that you write for, for someone you, you know that has never studied economics. Could be a friend, could be a family member. This way you will be forced to define everything, to explain things clearly, to give examples, to support your, the points that you make. And that's exactly what you need to do. If students have in mind that they write an essay for their teacher or for an examiner who have studied economics, then they might not um, make enough effort to explain things clearly. They might skip some definitions thinking, oh, why should I bother defining this? My teacher knows what this is. But again, if your students skip that, if they do not explain things clearly, if they do not illustrate things, then the examiners will not be able to assess the skills, um, the knowledge of, of, of your students. So I think it's a very important advice and uh, that can really prove useful for your students. Okay, application. Application is oops, not very complicated to explain. Application is all about examples. But there are several types of examples. So that's pretty much how you show your application skills. You have your the general economic theory that I sometimes see as a, a cloud, okay, a cloud where you have general concepts that are not specific to um, not specific to particular markets, not specific to particular countries, not specific to particular values for the data or something like that. And then application is pretty much your ability to apply this general theoretical knowledge to more specific cases. So that's where you use examples. The examples can be real world or fictive. It doesn't really matter. Of course, I would say that if you have real world example, things that have actually happened, uh, policies that have been actually implemented by governments, uh, then it's better. Um, but if you don't have that type of example, if you, are, if you can't think of any real world example, then it's fine to make up your own. Like if the price of wheat increases, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what's wrong with my uh, webcam, but I look like a Smurf. <laughs> okay, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the PPT, not my face. All right, uh, so you can use written examples. Uh, so if you talk about married goods, uh, yeah, okay, you can uh, you can use a written example and say, okay, for example, uh, in the case of uh, cigarettes, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I would call that a, a written example. Examples of goods and services whose demand is expected to be price inelastic. Uh, for example, uh, the demand for uh, insulin, you know, this medication for people who suffer from diabetes can be expected to be price inelastic. Could be examples, written examples of countries. Uh, where inflation is particularly high, for example, in Venezuela, blah, 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 or uh, yeah, that would be a real life example. So this is the first category of examples, written examples. There could be numerical examples. So if you have a, an essay question about inflation, perhaps you can use some figures, uh, come up with some data to calculate a consumer price index. Uh, if you have uh, an essay question about the income elasticity of demand, same thing. You could say, for example, if initially the income is $20 and now it's $30, okay? Like just com coming up with your own data in order to support your previous explanations. If you have something about unemployment, same thing. You can come up with some data. What if the, uh, the working population is made of 100 people and the labor force is only made out of 60 people, then you can calculate the labor force participation rate. You know, it's fine to you to create 
uh, your own numerical examples to come up with some data just to show that, hey, okay, that's how it works. I know how to do it. I know how to calculate it. And of course, this could be graphical examples. So it's uh, absolutely fine to use uh, diagrams. Uh, but if you really want to score application marks, then your diagrams should be specific, okay? Should be one particular market, not just uh, quantity price uh, on, uh, on the axis. But for example, you could have the quantity of honey, the price of honey. It would be better to focus on one specific, one particular market. So the example that I use here is, uh, for example, the market for honey versus the market for beeswax. So this would be a side-by-side -side, uh, diagram where you would show that these two goods are what we call in joint supply, right? When they are provided uh, together. Uh, okay, so three main ways uh, to show your uh, application skills, uh, but basically examples, real life or fictive examples, written, numerical and graphical examples. Uh, two tips. Sometimes <laughs> I have um, lazy students they know that they have to give examples. So, um, but they, so they just state it. Let's say we have an essay about public goods. So they will define it. Okay. So a public good is a good that is non-rival and non-extrudable, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then they will say, for example, street lights, boom, <laughs> period, no explanation whatsoever. Of course, uh, that's not a good practice. It's not enough to state that uh, these goods are, are examples of married goods, demerit goods, or blah, okay. You need to explain it. Why can we say that street light is a public good? So that in this particular example, they should explain why street light is non-rival, why street light is uh, non-excludable, okay? Uh, you could say another example, uh, negative consumption externalities. You could talk about cigarettes. Okay, but same thing. It's not enough to say, for example, cigarettes. It's definitely not enough to uh, gain application marks. They, they would need to explain something like uh, when uh, someone smokes cigarettes, there is a private cost, the cost to uh, this smoker's own health, but there is also a cost to the bystanders through a secondhand smoking or passive smoking. Okay, something like that. So we really understand why cigarettes are indeed an example or can be regarded as an example of a negative consumption externalities. So make sure that they do that. It's not enough to state uh, the example. And second tip that I want to share with you is to use diverse and relevant examples. Uh, you see the example that I use for public goods, uh, street light. It's probably the example that 99% of students use for married goods. 90% uh, will use uh, education and healthcare. And for demerit goods, same thing, 90% will use cigarettes and alcohol. And it's fine. Uh, it makes sense, no problem. But I just find this a bit boring. And I try to put myself in the shoes of an examiner that has to read uh, 400 or 500 essays uh, within a, a few days or weeks. Uh, so I've not worked as a Cambridge examiner, but I have marked many, many essays when I was still working at the university. And I just know that this is very boring uh, when you have all students in all essays that you mark that use the same examples. And on the other hand, when you come up with one essay, for one student that um, use an example that is a bit more original, that is different, then this is something that is going to capture your attention and something that is going to make the essay a bit more interesting. And we are economics teachers and we know, I guess, that among us tonight, there must also be some uh, business teachers. And you know that differentiation is one way to reduce competition, right? So I think examples are a good way to differentiate uh, yourself when you write an essay. So as teachers, I think we should, when you teach, uh, when we give examples to our students, I think it's okay to give them the typical examples, yeah? But I think it's our responsibility to also give them some additional examples that are a bit more original and that students could uh, use in their essays to differentiate themselves. I think this is something that can definitely make a difference. Okay, good. That's for application. Analysis, all right. Third assessment criterion or objective. Okay, so this is the, what I just typed here. This, I just copied the definition that is given in the Cambridge uh, syllabus, in the economics syllabus. Okay, so basically an analysis is just a connection uh, between uh, several concepts, but a logical connection. 
So what is the logical connection? A logical connection is simply a relationship between a condition and a conclusion. If blah, 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 then blah, blah, blah. In the case of, da, 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 okay, then the conclusion. Uh, so yeah, a condition is a cause or a case. So a cause could be uh, if, uh, let's say, the price of uh, honey rises, okay, this could be a cause, a change. And, or case could be something like uh, in the case of uh, a public good, okay? So this is not really a cause itself, it's more like a situation. You, you have different situations and depending on the situation, there might be several different uh, con consequences or effects. So that's a, what I call a condition. It usually starts with if, uh, when, or in the case of. Uh, and then the conclusion is basically an effect, a consequence, a deduction, a corollary. Okay, this pretty much all means the same thing, okay? But that's uh, basically what this is. So an, an analysis is a logical connection between a condition and a conclusion, a cause and a consequence, a cause and an effect, if you want. Um, I'll give you some examples, don't worry. So it means that you will have a, a logical chain. Logical chain is basically a, a chain where each uh, chain link with you. The first one will be the cause or the condition and then you will have the other uh, chain links will be the, the, the different consequences that you can uh, that you can uh, relate to the initial cause or the initial uh, case. Uh, so there could be a short logical chain, okay, if blah 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 then blah 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 and this is over, or there could be a longer logical chain if Da, 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 then da, 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 therefore da, 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 it follows that da, da, da. okay and in this case we we this basically indicates that your analysis is is a bit deeper if your analysis is just if blah 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 then blah 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 and you stop it's it tends to be a superficial analysis where you have only uh, connected two concepts just one cause one consequence a deeper analysis would be a situation where you start from the initial cause or the initial case, and then you try to uh, have uh, to connect it to multiple other concepts, okay? To go step by step towards the conclusion. There will be multiple steps to actually conclude what is going to be the consequence of the initial uh, change, for example. So I have uh, underlined often when I wrote that the length of the logical chain is often an indicator of the depth of the analysis because this is not always true. And I'm going to explain this in a moment. That's what I write here. A short logical chain does not necessarily mean that the analysis is superficial. There are two main reasons for that. Uh, first, because sometimes uh, you don't have much to say. Okay, You start from one uh, situation, if uh, blah, 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 then you will have one consequence and then there is not much more to say and I will illustrate uh, what I'm saying uh, in a minute and sometimes you have a student that will just uh, uh, connect one concept to the other so it might appear that the the analysis is, is a bit weak is a bit superficial but actually it can be very deep but this would simply be a situation where the student has uh, skipped some intermediate steps okay has just moved right away from the initial uh, cause to the final consequence and all the intermediary steps that would help us to uh, follow the train of thought have been skipped and it's not a good practice this is what i explained here the student may have simply omitted to explain the intermediate steps of his or her reasoning if examiners cannot follow the student's train of thought they will not award full analysis marks. Okay, so the point here is that if your students want to get a high analysis marks, it needs to be easy to follow the analysis. It must be easy to understand uh, how the student goes from one step to the other. If the step is too large, because the student has skipped too many stages, then it's going to be difficult for the examiner to ascertain whether the student actually understands how this works. I'll give you an example. So basically, there are two ways you can do it, okay? You can, uh, that's the, there is a good way to do it, where you start with the initial condition, and then you go step by step, okay? Small steps, easy to take. It's easy to move from one step to the other. So then we can reach the conclusion and no problem. We understand how we have moved from the condition to the conclusion. That's a good practice. 
And then you have the second case where the student has directly jumped from the initial condition to the final conclusion. In this case, the step is too high. And as an examiner, we don't know what to do because then there might be a, a, a good relationship between the condition and the conclusion. But if the student has not um, given details about the different steps, then it's impossible for the examiner to determine whether the logical connection is understood or not. More drawing. <laughs> Should I disable this feature? <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's, let's uh, have a look at a few examples. I have four examples and I will uh, um, make a short comment every time. How about this one? Um, if the demand is price elastic, so that's my initial condition, then a decrease in price will lead to an increase in total revenue. Okay, so it's correct, no problem. Uh, and you see there is one single consequence. Yeah, if blah, 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 then blah, blah, blah. Just, so it's something that can be regarded as a short logical chain. There are only two chain links. We only relate the PED with the total revenue. Does this mean that this is a superficial analysis? Not really, because in this particular case, there is not much more you can say, right? Once you have said that, it's difficult to relate it to, more, to other concepts. So again, as I said earlier, if the logical chain is rather short, it does not always mean that the analysis is weak. In this case, it's just that there is not much more to say. How about this one? In the case of married goods, same thing, that's my initial condition. The perceived benefit of consumption is lower than the true benefit of consumption. Okay. Therefore, consumers do not sufficiently demand married goods. Okay. So again, this is a rather short uh, logical chain because we have one initial condition and one single consequence. But in this case, I think we can agree that this is a bit superficial because there is much more that we could say, right? Basically, the student here has stopped too early in the analysis. We could continue, we could go deeper. For example, we could say, as a result, the equilibrium quantity in a free market will be lower than the socially optimal quantity. Okay, we could add one more chain link, if you want, in the, in the, analysis, in the analysis. And one last, why not? Uh, this all means that uh, total surplus will not be maximized and there will be a deadweight loss. Okay, you see? So in the first example, it's short, but it's not bad simply because there is not much more to say. But in the second example, I find this a bit superficial simply because that student could have added more chain links, more consequences, could have talked about total surplus, could have talked about the concept of under provision, could have talked about deadweight loss. Other example. If the interest rate goes down, then imports will fall. That's a different type of example. Here, the problem that we have is not that the analysis is superficial, because you see that the analysis seems very, very short. We only have like two chain links, one initial condition and one consequence. The problem here is that the student has skipped many uh, stages, has moved from an initial condition to the final conclusion, but many intermediate steps have been uh, skipped. And actually, I'm sure that mo most of you, when you read this uh, statement, I guess many of you uh, have, were not too sure about whether this was correct or not. It is a bit difficult to find out if this makes sense or not, right? Simply because in this case, the student has not guided you through the different stages to understand this final conclusion. A better analysis would be, of course, longer, but with all the intermediate steps, something like if the interest rate goes down, then there will be an outflow of hot money. As a result, the supply of domestic currency will increase, leading to a fall in the exchange rate. Therefore, pro foreign products will become less internationally competitive, and so imports will decrease. Okay, this way, you see that, let's go back to up this example. This way, I am guided step by step. And it's easy to move from one step to the other. So I can understand the conclusion. And as an examiner, I know that the student has understood this connection. 
if I just have something like that, if the interest rate goes down, then imports will fall. I, I, it's difficult for an examiner to give the analysis uh, marks in this case, because too many steps have been skipped. Okay, good. Let's have a look at the last, the last assessment objective, which is often the one that scares the students the most, the evaluation. Okay, so, and in most cases, uh, this is really where your students can improve. Uh, in most cases, they are pretty good at knowledge and understanding. They are pretty good at giving examples. They are pretty good at analysis, well, hopefully, but their evaluative skills are usually quite weak, and which means that this is uh, what we should be working on uh, if we want to uh, improve their skills and make sure that they have a much higher uh, grade. So what is, uh, first, uh, when are we expected or when will your students be expected to write an evaluation? So it's not always. So in AS, it's, that's only going to be in part B, okay? Uh, for part A, you will only have uh, knowledge and understanding application and explanation. Your students are not uh, assessed on, uh, their, on the, their evaluative uh, skills uh, in part A or in part B. In part B, there should always be uh, an evaluation, some evaluative comments. And in A2, uh, it depends. Uh, so it depends whether your students have picked a two-part uh, question, you know, part A, 12 marks, and part B, 13 marks. In this case, um, they will be expected to write an evaluation in part B only. And of course, if they have uh, picked a 25 mark essay, single part essay question, then they will be expected to uh, write an evaluation, of course. So uh, what we should keep in mind is that a good essay does not give an absolute, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I made a mistake, an absolute answer, not an absolute question, okay? A good essay does not give an absolute answer. Absolute would mean here something that is always true, or always false, okay? So if you have an essay question like, uh, in this case, uh, when there is a recession, uh, is it better to use uh, an expansionary monetary policy or an expansionary fiscal policy? Uh, if uh, the, the student concludes that uh, in this case, it is always better to use an expansionary fiscal policy, uh, it, this would be an absolute answer. Uh, and this is not what is expected. Uh, our students cannot be black and white thinkers. They have to be able to provide a finely shaded answer. Uh, so instead, okay, so this is not just black and white. <laughs> this is not just yes or no. Uh, we have to go beyond that. And we have to show that uh, the answer, a good essay recognizes that the answer depends on the combination of multiple factors, okay? It's not just yes always or no always, it's more complex. It depends on uh, several factors and the, the, the job, the work of your students when they write an evaluation is to explain, to discuss those factors. Uh, perhaps to illustrate it, Let's use an example. What if I, uh, yeah, it depends. <laughs> That's basically what an evaluation is about. Uh, example, what if I tell you, discuss whether or not electric cars are better for the environment than traditional petrol cars? I think many of us would be tempted to just say, uh, well, that's, that's a weird question because uh, we would be tempted to say, yes, yes, of course, uh, electric cars are better for the environment than traditional petrol cars. Yeah, so we would be tempted, some of us at least, we would be tempted to provide an absolute answer to that particular question. But of course, we would be wrong. Uh, if we go a bit deeper, if we go uh, beyond uh, our first impressions, then we can actually conclude that the answer to that question actually depends on many factors. And for example, and I did not choose this example uh, randomly, uh, I just uh, learned, I, I read uh, the conclusion of a very important study that concluded that electric cars in China are usually more polluting than petrol cars. And this is something that might appear uh, weird, uh, but the, the reason is actually quite simple, is that in China, a very large fraction of the electricity is produced by burning coal. And in that case, that makes it more polluting to drive an electric car than a petrol car. But again, not always. On average, 
Why on average? Because it also depends on uh, um, the mileage of the car, how many kilometers or how many miles you will uh, drive or, uh, with, with your car. So simply because producing an electric car is more polluting than producing uh, a traditional petrol car. So if you drive an electric car for just uh, 20,000 kilometers and then you no longer use it, then in this case, it's really going to make it more polluting. But if you drive it for, let's say, 200 or three, uh, 300,000 kilometers, then there will be a point where the electric car will become uh, less polluting than the traditional petrol car. And then there is something else that you could say. You could say, yeah, uh, but it, it depends on how do we measure the environmental impact? Uh, do we, are we talking about carbon dioxide emissions? Are we talking about uh, other possible ways we can measure environmental damage? And it also depends on the time horizon that we consider. In the long run, perhaps it might be better if this can uh, uh, mitigate the effects of global warming. But in the short term, this might be actually quite bad because you know that to produce uh, car batteries, we have to uh, extract some uh, rare earth element. And the extraction of these rare earth elements is extremely uh, polluting itself. So you see that an evaluation is, is really something that is going to explain that it's, it's not easy to answer this question. It cannot just be yes or no. It's actually uh, more complicated. It depends on many factors. And the evaluation is the part of your essay. That's what I explained here. The evaluation is the part of the essay in which students discuss the factors or variables that will have an influence on the answer provided. Okay, and in particular, this is where they should recognize or acknowledge the limitations of the arguments that they have previously developed. Because usually before an evaluation, what students do is that they will have one part where they will consider one side of the problem, the pros the, of something, for example, or arguments in favor of something. Then they will consider the other side of the problem. And same thing, they will put forward some arguments, uh, the cons of something, the arguments against something. And then they will write their evaluation. And what they should do is to assess the relevance, the strength, and to measure the limitations of all the previous points that they have put forward to, uh, before. And actually, when thinking, of, when thinking of an evaluation, I actually think of cooking. Uh, so I'm not going to lie. I don't cook very often and I'm not very good at cooking. I like baking desserts and bread, but not really uh, dishes. Uh, but I really see writing an essay as cooking in the sense that when you cook, the first thing that you do is to to put the ingredients together, to prepare the ingredients, okay? If you want to prepare some uh, uh, risotto, you will prepare the, 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 the vegetables, you will, you will clean them, you will peel them, you will cut them. So the first stage when you cook is to uh, prepare the ingredients. And once you have them, okay, this is actually where you start to combine them, to mix them, to, to create something. And I really see an essay as, a, a, I think an essay pretty much follows the same steps especially when you are expected to write an evaluation, because what you do first is that you will put, prepare your ingredients in your two parts, pros of something, cons of something. So you are preparing the ground for the evaluation. And to me, the evaluation is when you confront all these points, you assess them, you find their limitations and the factors that will have an, uh, an influence on the final answer that you provide. Okay. Uh, Something that you can tell them, useful. Uh, usually an evaluation should start by something like overall, whether or not, and then you copy the essay question, depends on multiple factors, including factor one, factor two, factor three. Okay, it doesn't have to be three. I think three is great. <laughs> if it's only two, it's not, it's not bad. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much how you can send a signal to the examiner saying that, hey, I'm about to start my evaluation. Okay, I'm ready for my evaluation now. I have all the ingredients. I can evaluate. What else? Yeah, so once you, your students have uh, pointed out all these factors that will have an influence on the, the best answer to provide, then they will be able to provide a finely shaded answer in the conclusion. Okay, something like if condition one is true and condition one, uh, condition two is false, then the answer to the essay is yes. If condition A is true and condition two is true, then the answer to the uh, essay question should be no. Okay, it really looks like computer programming. I don't know if any of you have done that before, but that's actually the way I see it. Okay, and of course, something else with lazy students, 
sometimes students know that they have to evaluate but they don't know how to do it they don't have time or they don't want to do it so sometimes they just say overall the answer to the question depends on many factors <laughs> boom and they stop here of course uh, uh, <laughs> there is no content at all and they will not receive any evaluative marks for that okay yes the answer depends on multiple factors which factors why how does this work okay so what does it depend on uh, let me briefly introduce what i call the test classification uh, it's a short document. I, I tried to uh, think about all the evaluative comments that we could come up with and I realized that actually they fall under four categories. Uh, there are four categories of evaluative comment that you could make. Uh, so that's why I call it the test classification. T is for uh, type, the E is for elasticity, the S is for size and the T is for time. And uh, well, again, there are of course, several possible uh, classification of evaluative comments, but this one at least makes sense to me and hopefully to uh, you and your students. Uh, so type, yeah, the answer to the question might depend on the type of something. Okay, you have an example, whether or not inflation is a serious issue depends on the type of inflation we are facing. Do we have cost push inflation or demand pull inflation? Okay, could, uh, the answer could depend on the elasticity of something whether or not the introduction of a minimum wage will lead to a substantial increase in classical unemployment depends on the price elasticity of the demand for labor. Okay, that's another type of evaluative comment we can make that is based on the elasticity of something. Size, so size is, uh, could be the level, the magnitude, the value, the intensity, the degree. Okay, could, it's actually, it, it uh, includes many, many things. Uh, whether or not an expansionary fiscal policy will be effective, at increasing real GDP depends on the initial level uh, of spare capacity in the economy. Okay, so that's one evaluative comment where we actually uh, talk about the size of something. And the last one, time, you, would, you could have an example, whether or not the benefits of economic growth outweigh its limitation depends on the time horizon considered. Is this the short run or is this the long run? Okay, so uh, I'm not gonna say too much about that. That's what I write here. We'll talk about this class classification during a future webinar. I, thing that we should uh, schedule one full webinar talking about evaluations as this is the most challenging skill to uh, acquire so i'm not going to tell more about that okay let's quickly talk about the importance of command words but you'll see that's just going to take a few minutes because i don't have much to say but you know what these command words are right let me share the okay these are the command words. This is the, uh, the syllabus, the current syllabus, and you have this list of command words and quick description of what they mean, what the students are expected to do if they see uh, one of these command words in the essay question. So today, the, the, the objective is not to go through <laughs> each of them one by one and to analyze what they mean. That would be too long and not very interesting. I'm, I'm rather gonna have a general uh, discussion about why this is important, that your students know them. Uh, and I hope that you have uh, given them this document. I hope that you have printed at least this page, uh, given this page to your students. Uh, and explain that this was definitely something important for them to write a, a good economic essay. Um, so let's get back to it. So why is this important? Uh, of course, because those command words, they give instructions. They, they, they tell students what to do. Uh, and if, if your students want to achieve high marks, then they need to follow the instructions. Uh, they also indicate what assessment objectives are being tested. Uh, usually, each command, when students, they see one particular command word, uh, they should know what assessment objective is being tested. So they, they, they should know whether they are expected to write an evaluation. They should know whether they are expected to uh, apply their knowledge to show application skills. So for example, if you have define, then this is clearly a command word that is testing knowledge and understanding. If you have illustrate, this is clearly a command word that is testing application. Of course, there are some command words that test multiple skills at the same time. Uh, for example, if you have explain, this is typically uh, a command word that tests the knowledge and understanding, analysis, and even application. If you have an essay that starts by discuss, in that case, all four assessment objectives are going to be tested. 
Okay. But I think it's important that your students understand the relationship between each command word and the assessment objectives that are being tested. Second, they give information about how much detail has to be given in the answer. There are some command words that suggest that the answer should be very brief. And there are some command words that suggest that the answer should be more detailed. Example, if you have one essay question when you will ask outline the main types of unemployment and one that explains or asks to describe the main types of unemployment, then this suggests that in the first one, the first one outline has to be very brief or at least briefer, shorter than the question in which the command word says describes. Okay. Same thing for state. State is something uh, you're not expected to give any detail, okay? Just to identify something. Identify, state, outline. These are command words that tell you or tell your students you are not expected to spend too much time on it, okay? But then describe, analyze, assess. These are things, command words, that expect much more information. And finally, uh, most command words can be associated with a particular essay structure. Uh, so it can help knowing what uh, command word we are dealing with can actually help the students to structure the, your, their essay in several parts. Typical example would be discuss versus explain. So explain, it often starts, that's usually part A, right? If you have explained, that's usually the first part of an essay question. So it usually starts with the relevant definitions. Uh, then it, uh, you have the analysis and then the illustration. Okay, that's uh, often something like that. So of course, it varies from one essay to the other, but that's typically what it looks like. Uh, if you see an essay with discuss, then it usually starts with some definitions if necessary. Uh, then you have two parts, where you, one where you will consider one side of the problem, the other where you will consider the other side, then you will have the evaluation and then a short conclusion. So you see some your students could just looking at the command words, they, could, they would already know how to organize their thoughts, how to organize their ideas. But again, we will schedule another webinar specifically dedicated to planning the answer and structuring essays, how to provide scaffolding to your students. So again, I don't want to say too much today. And it's late already. Okay, last point. How to choose which essay question to answer? Look at this poor guy hesitating between an essay on inflation and an essay on price control. Um, so basically in AS, students have to choose one essay out of three. And in A2, they have to choose two out of six. Uh, so you know, especially for A2, there are multiple combinations possible. I, I haven't calculated how many com possible combinations they are. If there are some, anyone good at mathematics, you can calculate this, uh, this value here. Uh, but it's actually an important decision. And as we know, as eco economists, <laughs> there is an opportunity cost, right? If we choose to answer to the first essay question, then we lose the possibility of answering to the second or third essay question. So we have to make sure that we make the best possible decision. It is important. And this decision should not be rushed. I am always very worried when I give the question papers to the students, especially when this is the, 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 the final exam. And I see them reading the essay questions real, really quick. Let's just say a 30 seconds and 30 seconds later, I see that they start writing. <laughs> so first, they don't really take time to choose what essay they will uh, uh, select and they don't even plan their answer. But let's leave the planning uh, aside for now. Let's just focus on the decision. How do we choose what essay question we will answer? And it's okay to take a few minutes to make that decision. I know that students are very pressured by the, the time, that time is limited, that they, 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 they don't want to waste time and they feel safe when they write. And that's why they usually <laughs> just write everything they know <laughs> about the, the topic because it just feels safe this way. But they should definitely spend one, two, up to three minutes simply to make a decision. Okay, what essay am I going to pick? What if they don't? What are the risks 
of rushing that decision. What can happen if they do not spend sufficient time to write, to choose the best essay question for them? There are six possible risks. First, they might just not answer the question. They will just write everything they know about one topic. They like inflation so much. So as soon as they see inflation in the question, they say, oh yeah, one essay question about inflation. I'm going to pick this one and I will write everything that I know about inflation. But that's just not gonna work. Uh, the student might have a decent grade because there will be knowledge and understanding. There might be analysis, there may be some application. But if the student does not really understand what the question is about and does not provide a very specific answer to the question, then it's impossible that this student will get a high mark. So that's one risk. Second risk, very common, going off topic. If we choose too fast, if we don't read the question well enough, if we don't ask ourselves, do we really understand what the question is about, we might actually start talking about things that are completely irrelevant, things that really do not help answering the question. Third risk, the opposite, <laughs> same thing. There might be some important points that would be overlooked. If we don't clearly understand what the question is about, we might not identify what are the key ideas that should be included. Next risk, being unable to illustrate and evaluate. To me, this is one of the most common problem. The students will pick the essay question simply uh, asking themselves, what do I know about uh, this topic? Do I know inflation well? Do I know economic growth well? Do I know market fare as well? But then they don't really ask themselves whether they will be able to uh, give examples, uh, whether they will be able to use uh, interesting diagrams, uh, whether they have interesting evaluative comments to make. They will mostly focus on knowledge and understanding and perhaps analysis. But in many instances, they will not ask themselves if they have enough, uh, if they have ways to apply their knowledge and ways to show their evaluative skills. So that's one big problem. Uh, another risk is to write a one-sided or an unbalanced essay. Uh, the, 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 this could be the case that the student has many arguments in favor of something, of one particular policy, but very few arguments against it or in favor of another policy. So this would be a one-sided essay. And again, uh, in this case, the evaluative comment might be very difficult to make. And uh, this would not show a... Um, they put this yeah, a finely shaded uh, <laughs> conclusion. Or the essay could be unbalanced. What I mean here is that, uh, especially for two-part essays, sometimes students have a very good understanding of part A and they write a very good answer, but then they, <laughs> they, really, uh, they are completely lost for part B because usually part A is quite simple. Uh, we give definitions, we give examples, we do a simple analysis and we can get relatively high marks. But then part B, they are often lost. They don't really know how to answer the question. So that's why they should really pay attention to, uh, to, to when they choose the essay question, not only focusing on part A, but also asking themselves, do I also understand what part B is about? And do I have enough content to include in this part B? And the last one that is not common, but I've seen, it, I've seen it happening before, is to change horse in midstream. So they basically pick one essay question and they start writing and then they realize, oh, <laughs> uh, I think I misunderstood the essay question. I think uh, I made a bad decision. So they just erase everything and they start all over again. And of course, that's not a good signal uh, that is sent to the examiner and this is uh, just time being wasted. So what I tell them is that choosing what essay question to answer in only 10 seconds or 30 seconds is madness, <laughs> complete madness to me, at least most of the time. So how should they, how should they do that? How, what selection criteria should they use? So they should ask themselves a few questions. First, do I feel confident about my subject knowledge of the content related to the essay question? Okay. Usually that's the only question they think about, <laughs> but it's good, but it's not enough. Do I clearly understand both parts of the question? Do I truly understand what this is about or do I find it a bit ambiguous? Do I understand what content has, is tested? Uh, do I know what I have to do? 
can I think of sufficient arguments to put forward in each part beyond the definitions, beyond the diagrams, beyond the examples? Do I have some good points to make in favor of something, against something that would be uh, very interesting and that would really help me to answer the question? Can I think of good examples to support my main points? Okay, if you want to gain the application marks, you need to be able to give examples. Before you choose the essay question, they should think about that. Will I have an opportunity to use diagrams? Using diagrams is a skill and they should demonstrate that skill. So it's, it's, it should be something they should always try to illustrate their points using a diagram simply so they can show the examiner that this is a skill that they have acquired. Can I think of interesting evaluative comments to make? As I explained before, it's, if they want to gain evaluation grades, they need to be able to make evaluative comments. Can they think of any evaluative comments? Okay, so this is uh, not a, uh, a full uh, list of questions. That's just what came to my mind when I prepared this, this webinar. Perhaps you can add <clears throat> a few more questions of what you think is relevant and what your students should think of when they make such an important decision as choosing what essay question to answer. Okay, and that's actually it for today. Uh, yeah, that's it. So, sorry, I was a bit long. It's already 7.05, but uh, let's uh, spend some, some time about uh, doing some uh, Q&A. All right, I see one question. Let me just, um, time to read it. Okay, appreciate it. Don't forget. Nice on the test classification. I will share this document with you. The test classification, I will share it with you. Maybe with your recommendation on differentiation. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, okay, so uh, it's a good point. Yes, I will, uh, okay, I will send you all the documents. Uh, I, I will give you the information just after this Q&A session. Uh, let me answer to uh, Amos Rao. I don't know how to pronounce that, sorry. Yes, uh, you're actually right. Using this, let's say, differentiated examples would be uh, good for, uh, let's say, higher ability students, but even not, not always. It's, it's true that for weaker students, it might be easier to use the standard examples simply because the standard examples are often the ones that are the easiest to explain. So if this is true, if the common examples are easier to explain, it's true that it might be difficult for, for these lower ability students to use more original examples. But again, there are some original examples that are easy to explain. And I think that's our job as teachers to provide these examples, okay? Because it's true that if you give them an, an, an example that is original, but that is so complicated to explain, uh, then it's definitely not a good decision to use it, okay? So I guess it, it all depends on, uh, is it easy to provide original examples? Do students really understand how they work or not? If they do, okay, great, go ahead. And if they don't, if they feel more confident relying on these standard examples, then they should probably stick with them. Uh, yeah. That's my view on this. Uh, so yes, I will share the PPT uh, for analysis. Do students always provided balanced analysis to get eight marks, cost benefits at... Um, do students always have to provide a balanced analysis to get eight marks? Uh, I'm not sure how to answer this, <laughs> honestly, uh, simply because I guess it, for the analysis uh, assessment objective, it really depends on the, on the essay question, because for example, if you look at the part A of an essay, you will not be expected to consider, you, you might not always be expected to consider the pros and cons of something, right? But still you can get full analysis, uh, analysis marks in, 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 in part A. So I, I don't know exactly if you are talking about the part A or, or part B here. But I, I guess it would depend. I, I think what really matters for analysis is basically how many points do you make? How many logical connections do you establish between, between concepts? Uh, then whether this each, uh, uh, it's, it's a complicated question because it, it, it really depends. It really depends on the essay question. If 
you have an essay question where you indeed have to consider two parts, then I guess, yes, it would be necessary to have to make uh, logical connections uh, in both parts. Because very often, if you look at the mark schemes, you often have up to four marks for, let's say, uh, the pros of something, up to four marks for the cons of something. So in that case, it would uh, probably be preferable to make uh, analytical comments in both parts. But in part A, where you will not necessarily have to consider both sides of an issue, I don't think this is something that is necessary to get full marks. That's all I can uh, tell you now. Uh, how can we be informed of the future workshops? Well, same, uh, same uh, ways. They will be the WeChat uh, Cambridge uh, group. There will be my own uh, econ doctor group. I will share the QR code with you in a minute. Uh, so yeah, and there will be my Facebook page again, econ doctor. And I don't know, perhaps uh, the uh, Cambridge, uh, the, the management at Cambridge International will share uh, the information on other platforms. I am not aware of, <laughs> but let's just say uh, Cambridge uh, WeChat group, my own WeChat group, my Facebook page at least. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, a very interesting, Sergey. according to Bloom's taxonomy, giving original examples is creating skills. Okay, uh, then I'm, I didn't know that, but you're right. Um, that's actually being original is being creative. So I agree with you. We can even include the very, very top uh, level of the Bloom's taxonomy by giving some uh, interesting or original examples. Uh, let me go down a bit in the chat box. Uh, if, AS, if AS part A and B have the same key terms, uh, in the question and related? No, absolutely not. That's a good, okay, it's, it's a very good point. If, um, for example, in part A and part B, you need to, uh, to talk about, um, let's say, I don't know, I, I, something I want to try to use different examples. You want to talk about the, uh, the HDI, okay, for example. So you, you talk about the HDI in the introduction in, in part A. So of course you need to define it. If you want to talk about it in part B again, if this is related, it's not useful to define it again. Okay, you have already defined it. There is no need to repeat yourself. It's a good question. No need to repeat yourself. Okay, Maggie, yeah, I used to suggest in my students A2 to, to draw uh, four to diagrams for 20 mark essays. Uh, it, really, it really depends, Maggie. There, I, I think for a 25 mark essay, I guess you can always use at least one, <laughs> at least one diagram. I can't think of any uh, 25 mark essay question where this would be impossible. Four diagram is may, maybe too much, uh, again, depending on the, on, on the, on the essay question. Uh, for some, I, I think it might be too much. For others, it's, it's going to be appropriate. So I think we should just avoid giving them uh, advices that would be, again, too absolute saying that you should always uh, use four diagrams. You should always write more than six or 700 words. And this is what is the most difficult. We have to teach them flexibility. We have to teach them to adapt to the essay question that they are facing. Uh, so we can give them general recommendations, something like you should try to use as many diagrams as possible. Okay. Uh, but again, it depends. It depends on the situation because if, if you give them this advice and you should have at least four diagrams, the risk is that they may force themselves to use diagrams that might not be very relevant and this would not be rewarded and they would simply lose time, waste time. Okay, Emily, I was wondering if we have any word limitation for essay question because sometimes students will ask me, <laughs> okay, so that's exactly what I said. Uh, no, I will not give you any uh, like information or any opinion about the the word limitation because the the range would be too large uh, to mean anything i have marked very long essay question that were very poor and i have marked very short uh, answers that were actually really good so it's i i don't think we should uh, we i don't think we should give them a word limit uh, not, at least not a maximum word limit. We should just tell them something. We should just tell them that uh, you are not expected to write everything you know about the topic. 
Uh, I've had some students doing that because again, it feels safe. And many of them feel like, oh, if I write everything I know, okay, that's the best I can do. No, there is a question. They have to understand that there is a specific answer to provide. Some of their knowledge is relevant to answer the question, but some of their knowledge is irrelevant and they should leave it aside. Uh, I know that myself, when I write an essay question, um, uh, when I write the keys, because I, I usually write the keys for, for my student, for 25 mark essay, I never go, write more than uh, 1,000 words, but it's already a lot, okay? That's already perhaps too much. And for an AS, I never write more than 800. Um, I try not to. But again, these are re this, my answers are very detailed, so. It doesn't really matter so, because some students are very good at, uh, are very concise. They can say a lot in just a few sentences. So in this case, a very short essay can be very good. Some other students are not very good at that. They will need, they will need many sentences to say just a few things. So in this case, their essay might be longer. So <laughs> I'm sorry, Emily, for not really answering your question, but I would rather not give specific uh, figures or specific numbers about the word limitation. Okay, I'm um, talking to Mr. iPad something. Uh, sometimes the students are asked to discuss the advantages or disadvantages of one question, for example, adds advantages and disadvantages of floating exchange rate system. How to construct the evaluation part? So again, uh, I am not going to answer that question. <laughs> I'm sorry, because we will have one webinar specifically about evaluation where I will use examples like this one uh, to show how we actually do it. How we, where, how we can actually approach it. Uh, today, the objective was just to understand what is the basic idea behind an evaluation, what you expect it to do, but I don't think we have time today to, uh, to, to go deeper into that, but I will, I promise, schedule one or even maybe several webinars dedicated to evaluations. Okay, I should still write a conclusion whether part A, part B, not in part A, uh, I don't think I have ever seen any mark scheme awarding marks for uh, a conclusion in part A, but yes, in part B and in A2, in 25 mark uh, essays, there should be at least one sentence for the conclusion, simply because there is often one mark that is allocated to the conclusion. But the conclusion should not be long and there should not, Please pay attention because this one is important. There should not be anything new in a conclusion. I'm, t I'm telling you this because very often you have the students that write in conclusion and then they realize that they forgot something or they still have some time. So they add something new, something that they have, that they have never talked before. So that's not a conclusion in this case. It's just not a conclusion. So when your students write in conclusion, there should not be anything new. This should just be a very quick answer, very brief answer to the essay question using the evaluation. Yeah, the conclusion should be uh, built upon the evaluation that came just before. Again, we will talk about conclusion more when we uh, learn how to structure an essay. <clears throat> Can we have a WeChat group for economics teachers for further discussions? Yes, I will share the information with you in a minute. Uh, essay writing in general follows the principle of PEL point explain extent. Yes, uh, absolutely. <coughs> uh, apart from the link, perhaps, um, because uh, usually the way I, I say it is uh, state, explain, illustrate, or state, explain, support. Uh, <coughs> for the link, I think it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's true in general when you write an essay. Uh, to connect your, your points to uh, perhaps different issues or to try to take it one step further. But for Cambridge essays, I'm not sure that this would be something rewarded. And since time is very limited, um, I, I, I don't think, I think we can um, overlook the link. But yes, for every point, and again, I have uh, documents on how to make a point you're absolutely right. First, the point should be stated, then the point should be explained, and then the point should be illustrated or supported. Absolutely. So if, if we remove the L, we will have another acronym. So I'm not going to, to, 
to read it, right? <laughs> okay, so yes, we can use a point explain example for, for economics SN, and actually it's not that we should, we must, we must use that. Okay, JK, uh, for the very top students in relation to evaluation and deep analysis, can they use further reading as the base of an argument? For example, in a 25 mark question, can they bring in something like the Marshall Plan and China's Belt and Road Initiative as a basis for analysis? Um, not as the basis for analysis, uh, but as the basis of uh, illustration. Um, <clears throat> there should always be, before the example, there should always be the, the, the general analysis, the theoretical analysis. And then to support this analysis, there should be an example. And using things like the Marshall Plan or the China's Belt and Road Initiative is something absolutely perfect to support a point that you have previously explained. Okay, but these examples uh, cannot replace the analysis. Okay, there should be the analysis first, like general analysis, theoretical analysis that is not specific to any particular uh, policy or initiative, and then the example to support it, to illustrate it. Um, well, these are examples, so I, I, I don't think any example can go beyond the, the, the syllabus, but yeah, that would be, as an examiner, I would love that. Again, I'm not an examiner, but I if I were, I would love it. Okay, let's move. Yeah. When discussing two sides of the question, students sometimes may have discussed and evaluated the pros and cons of each side in the body already, and that does not leave them much more to say in conclusion, which is better to always leave the discussion pros and cons, different conditions to last part of the essay. Okay, it's a good point. Uh, again, I, I will not talk about that uh, today, but I will just uh, introduce what I will tell you when we talk about evaluation. There is often uh, people wondering whether or not we should repeat ourselves in the evaluation, because basically you have your arguments in favor of something, against of something, and then you, in, sometimes in the evaluation, you don't really know what to write because you are afraid of just repeating yourself. Okay, but no, you should not repeat yourself simply because in the evaluation, you should assess the points that you have put forward before. You should take the limitations, but consider the limitations of each point. And this is completely different than just repeating the points that you have already made before. Again, I will use examples. Uh, I will write a full essay question to show you how we can make uh, like points in each part, pros of something, for example, cons of something. And then I will show you the purpose of the evaluation and I will show you that you will not repeat yourself at all, that you will actually come up with something completely different to confront these two parts and to reach a final judgment on the issue. How soon can we have further webinars? <laughs> as soon as I have time to prepare them. Uh, it takes time, of course. And uh, as I said, I, I'm a uh, a bit uh, busy right now with work and with a uh, one month old baby at home. Um, so uh, I, as I said, I, I truly hope that we can uh, meet once a week um, and I will let you know as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you so much for all your questions. Uh, it's not over yet. So one last thing. Yes, all documents that uh, were used tonight, as well as the recording of this webinar, because yes, this has been recorded, will be available at this address econdoctor.com slash essay writing slash chap one. Okay, I have not, do not try to uh, <laughs> go to that uh, address yet because I have not created the folder, but this will be the address where I will upload all the documents that I have used today. Uh, the PPT, the test classification, the, the, the two samples with the definitions and with the keywords uh, and the video recording of this webinar. Okay, one more thing. Yes, um, so there is a, I have a WeChat group that is called uh, Econ Doctor, but there are too many members at the time. So I think we, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think we can't use the QR code anymore to join it because there are over 200 members. So what you, you need to be invited to join the group now. So what you can do is to add me Okay, this is the QR code to uh, add my uh, personal WeChat uh, account. And, and then I can invite you, okay, into the, this uh, Econ Doctor WeChat group. And last but not least, please pay, pay attention. Stay, stay, stick with me for, for a minute. I would love to hear from you. Uh, I'm not used to this type of uh, webinars, especially not partnering, uh, like working with Cambridge. 
international. Uh, so please, 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 uh, please scan this QR code. This is going to uh, bring you to a, a form, like a survey, where you have a few questions about uh, the, the, the webinar, uh, what you liked about it, what you think can be improved. And I would very much appreciate if you could take five minutes of your time to, 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 to share some, some feedback with me so then I can use the, your uh, feedback, your thoughts, your suggestions, your encouragements, everything uh, in order to improve the quality of my future webinars. Okay, you ready? I, I will move to the next slide in, in 10 seconds. So if you don't have your phone with you, please, please, please scan this and takes and uh, yeah, it takes five minutes and that would, I would very much appreciate if you could do it. Okay, and that's all. That's all folks. So thanks again for joining this webinar tonight. Again, this was just chapter one. Uh, there will be many more chapters on essay writing skills and I hope that you will join and I hope that all this work that we do together uh, will be helpful to you as a, a teacher and uh, eventually will benefit your, your students when they take the, the final examination. All right, thank you very much everyone. Have a nice evening, enjoy your dinner if you haven't had uh, it yet and I will share uh, more information about uh, future webinars real soon. Thanks again. Have a nice evening. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye